thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And if you'd like to skip down to verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I fall and made a minister. Do bow your heads to a prayer. Our dear Holy Father, we thank you for the cross and what it means to us and for the salvation we have because of it. I pray you bless people today. Draw them to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I probably skipped reading the most important part of this chapter. Those verses that I skipped there are what the rest of it hinges around. And I didn't read them because of time and your attention spans. But those verses talk about Jesus being over everything. And if you go back and read them, it talks about Jesus being involved in creation. It talks about Jesus being preeminent or above everything else, whether it's creation itself or whether it's uh, like man's institutions. That even a king that is set up, that Jesus Christ is higher than that and is above that and is in charge of that, really, and in control. I don't know, sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but the Lord is in control of everything that goes on on this, this world. Um, because he is so preeminent, he was in a particular position to redeem us to himself because we were his enemies. And uh, I want to think about what does the cross mean today. I know we're nearing Easter, and next Sunday we'll probably talk about the cross in a different way, but today I want to talk about what does the cross provide for us, or the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? What does it mean, anyway? 1939, uh, Wilma remembers it well. In 1939, there was the beginning of what war? Two. World War II. Did you take part in it? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There was the beginning of World War II, 1939. Now, the United States had not yet entered, but most of the other countries in the world had entered World War II by 1939. December of 1941 in Hawaii. Does anybody remember what happened there? The bombing of Pearl Harbor. And the bombing of Pearl Harbor drew the United States into World War II. We had been just sort of sitting on the sidelines for the most part up to that point. At least that's the information we have. The United States was not involved pretty much up until then. But December 1941, shortly thereafter, the United States declares war against Japan. And then, because the United States has declared war against Japan, and the Axis are together, well, Germany and Italy declare war against us, so we declare war against them. And guess what? You have the United States involved in a war for the rest of the world. And there were allies and people on our side, like the United Kingdom, eventually even Stalin in Russia, which is interesting, but he was on our side. The war progressed on. There's a lot of ups and downs. In the war, Japan won that day at Pearl Harbor, obviously. It was a blind attack. But as the war grew on, the Allied powers, the United States side, eventually began to gain control of what was going on. They began to gain power. And the Axis powers began to diminish a bit. Germany made the mistake of invading Russia, which is never bright. Napoleon tried it, didn't work. And Japan was the subject of a couple nuclear bombs. So, VE Day, which was what? Was 1945, victory in Europe, May the 8th, 1945, any history people here? So, that was the day that Germany surrendered, and it was called a particular name, their surrender. It was unlike what happened in Korea, and it was unlike what happened in Vietnam, and it was unlike what happened in Iraq. The surrender that they were subject to was called an unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender. That meant they just had to take what was coming to them. They had no promises, no guarantees. They just had to take it. Well, a little bit later, I think it was maybe, was it 46, when Japan finally
finally surrendered, and they too surrendered to an unconditional surrender. Lots of their people had died, dropping bombs on Nagasaki, I think it was, Hiroshima, or Hiroshima, or however you pronounce it, and they were scared of what would happen if the United States continued to drop those bombs. The United States said that it was one of the easier ways to get out of it, because invading Japan would cost more lives, so they justified, we justified ourselves in dropping those bombs. But Japan said, unconditionally, we surrender. So the war was over. World War II that we can credit somewhat to getting us out of the Great Depression, which Charles Gray remembers well. World War II that shook up the country. And World War II that was called back then, what? The war to end all, end all wars. Now, we know that was a little bit of uh, being a bit overzealous and over positive. It was not the war to end all wars. But we haven't quite seen anything like it since. We've talked about World War III, but it hasn't got here. What I want to talk about is the United States in that position were in, the United States the Allied power was control. They had the upper hand over what was going on. Their enemies had surrendered unconditionally. Now, we know that the United States was, was kind. The Allied powers were kind. And as we always do in times of war, the United States who had destroyed these countries because they were our enemies goes back and does what? Rebuilds them to a great degree. There were some things that come out of it, the splitting up of Germany. There were some losses that the Axis powers had to endure because they had surrendered unconditionally. There was a great power and a lesser power. And in the, between the two, an unconditional surrender. Well, that's kind of what you have in the scripture today. There's a great power who is, who is the great power? God. And there is this lesser power who were his enemies who have been somewhat defeated. Who's that? That's us. And in between the two, God requires an unconditional surrender. Now, I don't know what would have happened, but I imagine in my head, if Japan had continued to rebel, do you think they would have continued dropping bombs? Possibly. I mean, they were killing, I think, was it, I don't, I don't remember, there was lots of people killed in the dropping of those bombs. Maybe even hundreds of thousands, I'm not sure the exact number, but there were plenty. So if that hadn't happened, if there was no unconditional surrender, then the United States might have continued dropping bombs. <coughs> But the unconditional surrender stopped the fighting, stopped the war, stopped the killing, and started the rebuilding. Now, for us as Christians, we are called to come to Jesus Christ and to give our lives to him. That is, in a sense, unconditional surrender. Last Sunday we played the song, I Surrender All. Well, that's what we're doing when we do that. We say that I'm laying everything in my life on the line. I'm giving it to God. Whatever he wants me to do, I'm willing to do it. I am, I am asking for his forgiveness. I'm just laying it all down, unconditionally surrendering myself to him and letting him have his way with me. Now, the thing is, in an unconditional surrender, God could ask a lot. The United States and the Allied powers could have asked a lot of Germany and Japan. Some people said, even though it wasn't quite the same kind of surrender, that when the United States overthrew Saddam Hussein and defeated Iraq, a lot of people pleaded that the United States should have gotten what? His oil. GT watches the news, doesn't he? Should have got the oil, people say. Because after all, we cost money, it costs lives, it, it costs people time away from their families who are American citizens going over there to free this country from Saddam Hussein's rule, dictatorship, whatever you want to call it. Should have got the oil. Well, we are in a position as people who have sinned against God that God can do whatever he wants with us. But the interesting thing is, that he chose to have mercy. He chooses to have mercy. The Bible said, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So I, I want to point out another difference between the United States and the war in World War II and how God deals with us. One of the other differences is that in how God deals with us, he took the initiative. The winning party took the initiative to end the war. When we fought in World War II, when uh, 
Charles Ray stormed the beaches of Normandy. <laughs> we were, we were trying to get them to say up, but weren't we? If you will, we were trying to get them to say, "I give up. It's over. I quit. Not going to fight anymore." Well, in the case of God, the stronger power has offered peace to the weaker. Isn't that interesting? That's a powerful thing. So He offers us this opportunity of peace, and we to in turn surrender ourselves to him. And in that surrender we gain what we lost by being his enemies. You say I'm not the enemy of God. Read verse 21. He said and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works that now hath he reconciled you. The Bible we've talked about quite a bit lately for times all of us under sin doesn't it? It says that every one of us has sinned against God. The Bible says they've all gone astray. He said that none of them seek after God. They are all unprofitable, and they have all sinned, and that's every human being on the face of the earth. We have all become God's enemies. Now, we can continue doing that, or we can turn to him and his offer of peace, whichever you want. There's another difference between the World War II surrender and our dealing with God. Just bad. 
bow down and just die. He's trying to give us good. He's trying to make life easy. He's trying to make it.